Good morning, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Wellness Way Quick Tips. I'm Dr. Zach Poppendick from the Wellness Way in Appleton. Uh, I'm here filling in for Dr. Patrick while he's out traveling, uh, doing some hormone connection events and talking to some colleges too. And today we are talking about a topic that is near and dear to my heart, and it is bacteria, all about probiotics. So probiotics, a lot of people have heard about probiotics, know a little bit about probiotics, um, and even just you know knowing that they are as a supplement, we're gonna go over a lot of different details in just talking about how complex the microbiome or all the different bacteria and all the different microorganisms that are within us and on us, it's, a, it's an extremely complex part of our immune system, and even just to know, you know what, uh, what their job is and what's a good probiotic, there's so many questions surrounding this, so we're gonna hope to uh, clear up some of that and even just uh, maybe teach you guys some things that are brand new too. So to you know, even just start out and you know, know that we're talking about bacteria, it's not just bacteria, um, but the, the microbiome or the normal flora, there's a lot of different things that uh, we can uh, use in naming just the, the, the complex you know, organisms that are all kind of working together with us. But the amount of them is sometimes just uh, you know, the, the first thing I like to start with and just knowing how much there is there. Because talking about good probiotics and bacteria and just knowing that there's just so many of them, the, the numbers, are very, I, I can't even wrap my mind around it. There's over 100 trillion different cells that are in our microbiome. And that's not just in our digestion. Because when we're talking about probiotics and the good guys that are in our gut, they're a part of our immune system, but they're communicating with our immune system, they're communicating with our digestion, and just the sheer numbers of them, they aren't all just in one spot, and it's really hard to find a sterile part of our body. There are bacteria and yeast and viruses, there's stuff all over us and in us, and they're you know, working together with us, but then there also are some bad guys too. So that's what I wanna kinda of start out and talking about is that when we think of bacteria and even go back like, you know, 20, 30, 40 years and just thinking of, holy cow, we gotta just be sanitizing everything and cleaning every surface and make sure you know, we're, we're washing everything down. Hand washing itself, yes, that is gonna actually be a huge benefit to stopping infection and stopping you know, transmitting, or, uh, transmitting the infection from person to person. But the, the use of Purell and the use of all of these different things that just knock out all bacteria, is actually gonna be something that'll uh, harm and affect our, our immune system. So the microbiome and the good bacteria in our gut, um, you know, talking about probiotics, probiotics aren't just bacteria. And when you think about just all the different cells that we have and the different cells that are working with us for that microbiome, there are good bacteria, there are bad bacteria that can create infection, and then there are uh, another group that sometimes get ca uh, called commensal bacteria, or what I like to call them is opportunistic bacteria, because they're gonna take that opportunity if they get it. So the differences in these are uh, that we've get <clears throat> that we've got uh, um, you know, the, the bacteria that are creating a lot of benefits for us, and I'm gonna go over some of those as we go, and then there are the ones that are invaders. So things like food poisoning, or if you know, we go down to Mexico and we drink the water, you know, there are different types of bacteria we don't want in us or on us at all, and they can create some very bad infections. It's the opportunistic bacteria that you know, within us, we've got you know, somewhere between 15 and 35,000 different species of bacteria, and everybody's a little bit different. So if we looked at, you know, even just take uh, two identical twins, their DNA is gonna be almost identical, but if you look at the, uh, the bacteria in their GI, it's actually gonna be pretty different. And from person to person, we have just such a varying amount of diversity within that bacteria and yeast within our GI, both in us and on us too. And it's that diversity that actually is what makes that, uh, that opportunistic bacteria a little bit more unique in, in trying to figure out which ones can cause problems versus what won't cause problems. So it's probiotics that typically we're talking about the good bacteria the ones that we know are gonna provide a benefit, and there are some that kind of uh, are gonna be on that, uh, that middle line where they can create some problems if they're overgrowing, and then they can also create some benefit if they're in balance with all the rest of the bacteria in our GI too. So big question that uh, I, I get a lot is, 
where are we getting good bacteria from and do I need to take a probiotic every day or you know how can I help my gut health and sometimes it even just starts with knowing where our bacteria and our, our, our good normal flora come from and where we actually got them to start out and with this being uh, Mother's Day weekend it's a pretty good opportunity to uh, find out that and, and then thank your mom because she's the one who actually gave you and started out your immune system with that bacteria so when we're born that's our first big time exposure to outside bacteria when uh, even just talking about the differences in uh, an infant's bacteria in their GI and on their skin when having that difference between a vaginal birth and a c-section birth so what's the baby's first exposure to bacteria is it mom's normal flora or is it the nurse's normal flora and it's what there is on their skin or what's in the hospital that first exposure sets the baby up and sets the immune system for being able to start building and knowing what's familiar and how to communicate with the immune system so vaginal birth versus c-section birth i know there's a lot of studies out there that actually show increase in chances of uh, allergies and asthma with c-section birth versus vaginal birth and it's the uh, you know the the um, the next step in uh, building an immune system that is through food and what's the baby's food what should baby be uh, eating or drinking in the first year of life and that's breast milk and dr. Jacqueline did uh, a quick tip not too long ago about breast milk and called it liquid gold and that's just what it is and how much immune system information is in breast milk is astonishing it is just packed full of good probiotics as well as prebiotics and we'll talk about what those are in a little bit uh, but probiotics that are in breast milk it is just uh, an amazing amazing thing to find out how mom is actually giving immune system information to her child and it even starts within mom's gut so there are tiny little cells within gut lining that are called dendritic cells and they've got these little projections these little arms that they can reach out into the gut and they can sample some of that bacteria and they grab that bacteria and they can actually internalize it into that little dendritic cell and then it travels over to our immune cells that are called lymphocytes and it can actually transfer that little bacteria over to those lymphocytes and just in that name lymphocytes where do they get to go through the lymph so our lymphatic vessels and our lymph nodes and they actually travel to the breast tissue and then release that bacteria into the breast milk and then the baby gets it right into their digestive system so it's just an amazing process that you know what's going on in mom's GI and mom's gut that is actually going to be helping to form the immune system of her baby. So what do you think that means for you know, food allergies for mom? Or if mom's taking certain medications, that's going to affect baby's immune system and even just their, their start of their immune microbiome within their GI. So the function that we have for these bacteria and, you know, and what they, they give us for the, the benefit are not only just things that they can create on their own but also how they stimulate our body too so the you know the, the medications that can affect the good bacteria are ones that are going to affect our good digestion too so the things that uh, probiotic and even just the good bacteria that we have living in our gi some of the things that they do is release D, uh, these different uh, immune system messengers that part of their job is to decrease the, the pathogenic or the, the, the bad bacteria and decrease their numbers, decrease their ability to stick to us, and even just decrease their ability to create an overall infection. So it's that ability of our own good bacteria to keep bad bacteria from overgrowing that the word balance gets used a lot. And when things are imbalanced, having a decrease in good bacteria that's where those opportunistic bacteria can start to take over and sometimes we call those potentially pathogenic bacteria because if they're in small amounts they actually can be a benefit sometimes but if we've got a lot of the good bacteria that start to go down in numbers now those opportunistic bacteria start to go up and up and now they're imbalanced and now they can create some big time issues and that is sometimes even called dysbiosis and it's that imbalance within our, our bacteria that we now start to get some of the bad bacteria that can piggyback on that and create infections. So good bacteria and good uh, um, balance within our GI is something that depends on you know, our, our, the beginning of our life and you know, how we were actually uh, fed our first bacteria. And now think about you know, even just after breastfeeding, what does every kid do when they're down on the, on the ground playing with toys? They pick up that toy and where do they put it? Right in their mouth. 
So babies are really smart. We don't give them enough credit for this. They're really, really smart because they actually are trying to teach their immune system by exposing it to different things from the external world. So the bacteria and the yeast that we have are constantly learning based on what our environment is. And if mom has a lot of food allergies and if mom has a lot of immune system issues, then the baby is actually set up to even just start to learn it that way too. So the experience is really just getting a lot of variety of different things that start to teach our immune system what's a good guy, what's a bad guy, how do we keep in balance, and it's some of the big time medications that affect mom that can actually affect baby that make it harder for them to create that balance early on. So the immune system function in those good bacteria versus the bad bacteria, the, the good bacteria release a ton of uh, these beneficial immune system uh, signalers that you know, they can not only suppress those numbers of the pathogens, but they also stimulate your own GI cells uh, called enterocytes. Your own GI cells, they want to create a barrier. They want to create some things that are going to make sure pathogens just keep on moving and they don't create any kind of infection. So our mucus barrier is a big part of that. And the mucus producing cells in our GI, they're actually listening to the good bacteria and the signals they're sending them because then they're gonna know, okay, we need to respond a little bit more, we need to create a bigger barrier. And when we have that imbalance, part of that imbalance means that mucus layer in our physical barrier starts to decrease. And if that's decreasing, now we're having a breakdown that's actually affecting those cells directly. And things like leaky gut or bacterial overgrowth that now starting affecting the, the bloodstream can create some systemic issues. And you know, even just having imbalanced and inflamed GI can create joint issues, can create joint pain, can create a lot of other chronic diseases and contribute to those. So you know, when we talk about 80% of the immune system living in the GI, a lot of it has to do with that balanced microbiome. And a lot of it has to do with an intact physical barrier or a mucus barrier and all of those cells working together to communicate where they are in terms of what's a bad guy and what's a good guy and how do we know to, you know, to make sure that things are moving the right way. Because if there is infection, that's what is going to give some of the signals that change just how often we're having a bowel movement or uh, you know, even just the, the, the patterns of you know, how, uh, how, how loose or how uh, uh, watery diarrhea we can have or if we're really constipated and things are really dry. It's that mucus barrier and our immune response that if we think about diarrhea versus constipation, if I had to pick between one of those two, it, it's, our, you know, it's not really a, a great uh, you know, set of options to pick between, but diarrhea is usually a good sign in most cases because it's a sign of your body trying to flush something out. So it's driving more water into the GI and trying to get rid of things. Now, if there's a lot of swelling and inflammation of the GI lining, sometimes that can create constipation because it's making things harder to move through. So the good bacteria can be a part of just getting that replenishment of our GI cells and getting them to create that mucus barrier that helps things to be moving along and restoring just what it is that our immune cells are doing. So knowing that that inflammatory balance is something that your immune system is always trying to uh, um, try to create a little bit better of a response to, there are different uh, lymphocytes, and one of them are called T regulatory cells, that they are working on trying to damp down inflammation. And it's the information they get from good bacteria and probiotics that are actually helping them out to take down that inflammatory response. So the different uh, interleukins, and uh, another one called tumor necrosis factor, or TNF. Those things are the, the, the immune signals that are driving inflammation, and our immune cells and our good bacteria work together to try to decrease that response when we do have something that triggers it or we do have an imbalance or an infection too. So knowing that we've got you know, all these different things that they can create, the good bacteria, to keep the bad things down, it's knowing what their job is together, working together, that what we do with our diet, what we have for our environment, everything that's affecting our good bacteria, it's probably pretty important to know what's going to be harmful to the good bacteria because the answer to you know, how we keep a good balanced uh, uh, microbiome and good balanced GI is not just take as many probiotics as possible. Because if you've got a bad diet, or you eat the exact same thing every single day, that's gonna be something that'll actually decrease your good bacteria. No matter how much of the probiotics you take, if you have a bad diet, you can't out-supplement a bad diet. And you can't out-supplement 
eating your food allergies and eating things that are going to be inflammatory trigger. And you know the things that are really harmful to good bacteria are going to be just the you know the the processed foods, eating high amounts of processed sugars, things that are more pro-inflammatory. And you know even just the uh, uh, alcohol intake and alcoholic beverages and you know um, you know people that uh, uh, have a lot of stomach issues and we're talking about you know real severe with alcoholism their stomach and the, the you know just the lining of the stomach and the good and bad bacterial balance is something that has shifted so far so even just you know having a, a beer a night can actually shift the GI balance towards that uh, that imbalanced or towards that dysbiotic type of environment. So one of the other things that, you know, even outside of just a dietary uh, factor is emotional stress. And if you've got a ton of emotional stress, they've actually shown that that can decrease good bacteria and it changes the environment of our GI. And one of the ways that it does that is actually decreasing your good acid production in your stomach. So the stomach itself actually sets the stage for your digestion, and it's you know, one of the first stops, obviously, in our digestion, but digestion really actually starts when you start thinking about food and when you start uh, uh, you know, even just smelling food or uh, really just interacting with your senses that you know, the, the saliva that you start producing, when you start salivating and you start thinking about a great dinner or something that you, you haven't eaten in a while, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm really craving something you actually start to salivate, that same thing is going on within your stomach and you're producing more stomach acid to get ready for that digestion. Now, if we've got a ton of emotional stress, that fight or flight starts to kick in and the opposite of fight or flight is rest and digest. So we actually start decreasing our digestive juices, we start decreasing our digestive function when we, in that, when we are in that fight or flight or when we're in that huge amount of stress. So it's the balance within our stomach that actually leads to bacterial overgrowth within the small intestine and the large intestine. And it's within the large intestine or the colon that the majority of our good bacteria are gonna be living. So it's you know, the entire process of our GI that really sets the stage for having a healthy and uh, balanced GI in terms of our, our good and bad bacteria. So the, the things that decrease the, the acid in our stomach, emotional stress is one we just, we can't forget about. And we talk about this all the time at, uh, uh, you know, at our events and even just in, uh, in the office talking about traumas and toxins and thoughts. And all of those create inflammation and they all are gonna be something that can, can trigger on that fight or flight that's gonna negatively affect digestion. So high amounts of stress means poor digestive function and big time imbalance. So now with people that have a lot of acid reflux, they're thinking, oh no, I've got plenty of acid, I should be good on that one, I've got so much I actually have to take an antacid. That's not how that works. <laughs> and the, you know, the antacids are gonna be some of the biggest things that can set up for bacterial infection or um, you know, even just some of those opportunistic bacteria to start to take over because of the fact that their job is to stop acid and acid is actually you know, part of the stomach's function and working as a decontamination tank. So when we are eating foods, they aren't sterile. They're coming in with all kinds of outside uh, bugs too. And it's up to our stomach to be able to kill off the ones that we know won't survive there. So there are a lot of things that should be able to survive that are actually a benefit. And that should be even something that you know, a lot of probiotics are able to do is survive the stomach acidity. And it's how some of the, you know, the probiotics are made and even just the types of, uh, of bacteria and yeast that are in there that their job is to be able to survive in our GI. They're used to being in there, and it's the bad bacteria that they should not be able to survive when there is a perfect environment or when there is a good acidic environment in the stomach, allowing for the stomach to, to um, feed the small intestine and the large intestine with a good balance. So the big things, and most people know about these, so we'll get right into that, is probiotics versus antibiotics. Because antibiotics are the worst thing for a good microbiome. And now does that mean that we can never have an antibiotic and we should never ever take them? No, that's not what I'm saying. Because there are times that you know, somebody needs to take an antibiotic if they've got a high level infection, you know, something that can be life threatening, of course they need to take an antibiotic. But trying to avoid antibiotics as much as possible, it's the over, -prescri or over uh, um, prescribing of antibiotics that now has led to quite a few uh, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria and you know, even just the, the, the common bacteria that we can have as an imbalance or an overgrowth within our GI, that now we're seeing a lot of these that are actually resistant to bacteria, or I'm sorry, resistant to antibiotics, that you know, some of the more common things that we want to try to keep them in balance with, now they aren't even gonna respond to that too, and it's like they're these superbugs that are creating this havoc. So the antibiotics, and even just knowing if we have one dose, 
they, there's countless studies now showing just how detrimental it is to the diversity or just the amount of different bacteria we have and the length of time it takes to get back on track with a good GI, because after having a, 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 uh, an antibiotic, a lot of times the advice is, well, you should take a probiotic then afterwards. Well, the advice has actually shifted, and if you talk to some of the, uh, the, the pharmacists that are now in the know on this, they'll actually recommend people to be taking an, an or I'm sorry, a probiotic at the same time as taking the antibiotic. It's making sure that you know, we're still feeding in some of the good bacteria in there because the job of the antibiotic, it doesn't care if you're a good bacteria, a bad bacteria. It's, uh, you know, I, I always just kind of uh, compare it to napalm. It doesn't matter who you are, it's just gonna set everything on fire. So knowing that that good bacteria versus the bad bacteria and who's you know, trying to keep in balance, antibiotic comes in and just goes, I don't care who you are, everybody out. And it decreases that balance, and it's that decrease in the good bacteria that now allows for yeast overgrowth. And it's really common to have yeast infections after antibiotic use, and that's part of the reason why. Because you knock down all the good bacteria along with what it is that was trying to be fought at, as an infection in the bad bacteria. But now some of the yeast that we have, which everybody's got a, a normal flora of yeast in our GI, and it's that they're kept in check or they're kept in balance by good bacteria that when you knock down all the good bacteria, now we can get yeast infections that come about all the time. So it's even just the different medications that affect the good bacteria, whether it be birth control or an antibiotic, that yeast infections can become that much more common after having that uh, uh, exposure to our GI. So the amount of time it takes to get back to something closer to a, a normal uh, microbiome or a normal balance in the GI after having antibiotic can take anywhere from two to four years to start to get back on track. And there are, you know, even just uh, you know a few uh, different studies out there showing that really there are some colonies of bacteria within our GI that never actually recover and they don't ever get back up to the levels that they're supposed to be. So taking a probiotic after having antibiotic is almost a necessity and something you need to do. But we shouldn't just be relying on only those uh, probiotics that are you know, in pill form or in capsule form uh, um, or even just in the, the powders that the supplements, those are useful for being able to get a large amount and I'll talk a little bit about uh, you know, just what to look for in probiotics themselves. But it's, it's knowing that you know, the, the balance therein, we should be supporting all the time and every day, sometimes not even with the use of a supplement too. So the probiotics versus the antibiotics and just the effect that they can have when trying to rebuild things and getting good, um, good bacteria back into the mix, um, prebiotics and probiotics sometimes get a little bit uh, of a confusing uh, um, for the terminology in terms of you know, what the heck they even are. So that's why I wanna start with even just uh, um, telling you what a prebiotic is. So the difference prebiotic versus probiotic, the letter E is the only difference. There, you got it. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but a prebiotic is actually food for the bacteria. So a good way to think of this is the good bacteria in our GI are like Pac-Mans. And uh, if you ever play the game Pac-Man, I hope everybody here has. There may be some, uh, some people who are like, what's a Pac-Man? But Pac-Man, he's going around, just think of him going around in, uh, in, the little, uh, uh, um, in the level there, and the little dots that he's going around and eating, the dots are like prebiotics. So then the ghosts that are coming around, running around, those, are guys, those guys are like the bad bacteria. So thinking about that balance, in order to have Pac-Man be strong and be able to take out some of the bad guys, you gotta make sure that he's feeding himself those good prebiotics. So the different things I've listed up here for the prebiotics are some of the ones that are you know, used you know, in different uh, supplements. They'll, they'll use, uh, you'll see the word inulin in there a lot. And inulin can be found as a prebiotic in a lot of different foods and a lot of different plants. It's just that chicory root is one of the highest concentrations of inulin. And you'll typically see that as a powderized form there are a lot of different prebiotics. So really what is prebiotic? If you just had to remember one word, it's fiber. Prebiotics are fiber and that's what good bacteria like to eat. So if you ever have a really, really high amount of fiber in a meal and you don't normally have a ton of fiber, you can blow it up pretty big and you can feel like, holy cow, I'm like 10 months pregnant. And I know that <laughs> nine months is a typical gestation period, but it's the uh, amount of uh, uh, food that you're giving those bacteria that they actually are going through a feeding frenzy. And when they go into that feeding frenzy, they actually create a ton of gas as a byproduct. So some people, they don't have a ton of fiber in their diet at all, and then they eat a giant bowl of broccoli. They might be farting for a little while afterwards because they just fed their bacteria a ton of fiber and they went on a feeding frenzy. But then if you starve them again, things will go kind of back and forth. 
So with the bad bacteria and the opportunistic bacteria, they can do that same thing. So sometimes having a bad diet and eating some bad foods and, and eating food allergies, you actually are going to get more bloating along with that too because some of the opportunistic and bad bacteria are now creating some gas as well. So it's you know that balance that we always want to make sure that we're getting back to that the prebiotics, when having those good fiber sources on a regular basis, you're continuing to feed those good bacteria. So a lot of good probiotics are going to have a prebiotic right in there with it. And a lot of times they call it a symbiotic, S-Y-N biotic, because those guys are combined together, they're working together. And you know, it's, it's knowing that uh, the foods are usually the biggest part of uh, um, you know, where we're getting some of these from. I'm going to go over some different fermented foods in a little bit, but it's the benefits of the good bacteria that I couldn't even try to fit them all on here. So I just fit up some big ones on here and just knowing that you know, the, the good bacteria, their job, aside from even just being a part of our immune system, is to help us break down foods and help us digest things. So when talking about even just different fermented foods, Thinking of a fermented food, it's really like a pre-digested food where those bacteria are starting to do part of the work for you before you even eat that. And fermented foods, there's you know a, a long history of uh, a fermentation that you know even just a, ahead of doing this quick tip this morning, I was um, looking through all just the different uh, lists of all the different fermented foods, and there are just hundreds and hundreds. There's tons that I hadn't even heard of, and even just a little funny thing that I saw when I was looking through there is I was looking through the list of fermented foods, and I saw ketchup was listed in there, and I was like. That's weird because today ketchup is mostly just high fructose corn syrup and some maybe tomato paste and some spices thrown in there. So the, the history of ketchup and even just why it was listed as fermented food is that really, honestly, ketchup really wasn't made from tomatoes until like the 1800s. That before that, in uh, Southeast Asia and China, it was actually just a, a fish sauce and spices that was fermented and left to sit out, and that was what they called K-chap. And it got translated over to ketchup and uh, being made from uh, mushrooms and then eventually uh, um, tomatoes has got to the point where we're at today. So ketchup and its origins as a, a fermented food, we've lost the art of fermentation. And that's you know, the, the big point of you know, where a lot of foods in the, you know, before refrigeration were fermented, it's a way to preserve foods. And it's the good bacteria that are actually a part of that preservation that then when we eat them, they're helping to preserve us in terms of helping our immune system and building us up that way too. So the, the different benefits that we have in the enzyme production is like a pre-digestion. And our bodies are, you know, from you know, when we're born, we're equipped to be able to break down milk sugars. And that's one of the, the enzymes I wanted to kind of highlight a little bit is, you know, the, the sugar lactose, the enzyme that breaks it down is lactase. And as we age, our lactase production actually goes down. It's supposed to, because we're not supposed to drink milk our entire life. Um, and it's the, the, the lactose intolerance that some people experience that it's actually a part of a bacterial imbalance too. And knowing that our enzyme production is actually supported by those good bacteria, helping to break down some of those proteins early on in life, that you know, even just some people that say, oh, I have a little bit of milk and I just blow it up and I have a ton of issue. Sometimes that can be a food allergy to the milk. Sometimes that can be, uh, just an intolerance to the sugars that are in the milk too. So the, the benefits of that, <clears throat> excuse me, of that good bacterial balance is helping us to break down some things that we're really not supposed to tolerate all that well, but the bacteria are trying to step in and help us out. Um, so the nutrients and the, the, uh, the, the different vitamins that we make, probiotics and good bacteria in our gut, they actually make a ton of B vitamins. They make vitamin K for us as well. And the nutrients that they make uh, are called short chain fatty acids. And those are the short chain fatty acids, those are the things that are created when they eat those prebiotics, when they eat the fibers. And the short chain fatty acids are actually food for your gut cells. So probiotics are eating the prebiotics to then make the fuel that helps to replenish and rebuild your GI. So the good foods that we're eating should be forming that, you know, that, that bond between good fibers and good bacteria that are already in there, that having a lot of different things that are gonna balance us out should be from the dietary, uh, um, dietary aspect first and foremost before we just start thinking, oh, we just gotta get a supplement and that'll take care of my bad diet. 
So the, the other properties that the good bacteria are going to have um, are the, the antifungal, which I kind of mentioned already too, and just that you know when we have good bacteria, it helps to keep the, the bad uh, uh, bacteria down, but it also helps to keep the different yeasts and the different fungus that can create a, an infection. And uh, candida or candidiasis is a common one that gets talked about. And a lot of people don't know, candida is a normal flora. It's a normal yeast to be found in the GI and can be seen at normal levels, but when it starts to overgrow, that thing can create a ton of problems. Now with probiotics, a lot of times we think of probiotics as just being a beneficial bacteria in a, in a supplement, but there are beneficial yeasts that can be considered a probiotic as well. And even some of those beneficial yeasts have antifungal properties. And Saccharomyces boulardii is just one of them, and it has a ton of benefits just for being able to balance those uh, good bacteria versus the yeast and their, their ability to overgrow. Uh, but having a single strain in a probiotic and in a supplement is actually something that uh, I wouldn't recommend. And you know, the, the ideal type of probiotic that we should be using is something that has multiple strains, multiple species, and high amounts of those because we want to try to get that bigger balance and not just try to flood the system with one type of probiotic, or I'm sorry, one type of strain, because that may even create an imbalance as well. And some people that take just one strain in high amounts can actually create their own imbalance and create their own infection doing that too. So multiple species, multiple strains, strains and multiple numbers of those different uh, strains are actually giving you more of a broad type of uh, uh, balance in that type of a supplement too. So the foods that are going to be affecting that um, you know, are, are ones that aren't, <laughs> and even just thinking about what's in that food, foods don't just have one strain of bacteria, they have a ton. So it's knowing that variety is really what you're trying to encourage too. Um, so detoxing estrogens, I know Dr. Patrick and well pretty much everybody at the Wellness Way talks a lot about uh, the hormone balance. And it's within the GI that we actually will have the, the, the different estrogens as we're detoxing them out get bound up to be able to leave. And it's bacterial imbalance. There's actually, when we have the um, potentially pathogenic and the, the opportunistic bacteria that overgrow, uh, and even just some of the infectious bacteria, they create something called beta-glucuronidase. And this is something that actually recirculates toxins and it can work on the, 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 uh, uh, the more harmful types of estrogens as they're trying to leave, they actually will break them apart and then they get reabsorbed into the bloodstream and they recirculate those different estrogens. So helping your body to be able to detox correctly relies on a good bacterial balance in the GI. So knowing that we're detoxing those estrogens out, you can be taking all the good supplements that can help the liver to be able to process them, but once they get into the the GI, they need to be able to leave. And if we've got bacterial imbalance, it can actually start to recirculate a lot of those things too. Um, so the, the other two things I have in there, the skin health and the mood, things that are going on in the GI, a lot of times if we've got you know, a rash or if we've got uh, even acne, you know, there's a lot of things that the skin will show us. I always kind of you know, call the, the skin as kind of like a name tag for your, your GI health. And knowing what's going on in the skin is a pretty good look at what's going on inside of the GI as well. So skin health relies heavily on that. So there are some autoimmune conditions that you know, are um, highlighted by changes in the skin, whether it be psoriasis or eczema, that the first thing that I'm always thinking about and looking towards is what is going on within the GI and what are our food allergies looking like too? Because when there are a lot of different inflammatory triggers, now we know that the, the mucus barrier and the, the cells are actually struggling to keep a balance and it's a good and bad bacteria balance that now gets shifted and we can have even those infections that flare up those too. So knowing that uh, you know, our skin health is tied to it, the gut-brain connection, that is the other you know, part of uh, um, where the, the, our immune system and our, our GI is actually working together to create a healthy immune system. And it's our mood and putting the, uh, uh, our mood connected to our GI, the gut-brain connection is powerful. And we've got this awesome part of our nervous system called the vagus nerve that is going from the base of your brainstem to your heart, your lungs, and your GI, and it's surrounding everything in your GI, and what it's doing is it's gathering information, and it's gathering information, and it's bringing it up to the brain. So it's this constant back and forth communication that the majority of it is actually coming from the GI going up to the brain. So things that you eat 
And things that create inflammatory trigger can have a huge impact on your mood and your emotion. And when there is imbalance and when there is the, uh, the opportunistic bacteria and the bad bacteria starting to create infection, that can have a huge impact on our mood. And I know a lot of people can uh, um, you know, kind of relate to the fact that when you have an upset stomach, it can put you in a bad mood. But knowing that there can be some roots of depression in the bacterial balance and in the, the yeast balance and just the overall balance of our microbiome, paying attention to what we're eating is hugely important to working on our mood and working on our overall health too. So fermented foods, I did mention uh, a few of them, that, or not a few of them, but uh, uh, that they're kind of pre-digesting or that uh, uh, it's something that we really are going to be you know, needing to focus on, that it shouldn't be just getting a, a good probiotic supplement and then we can eat like crap. It's the fermented foods that I want to make sure that I'm encouraging everybody to try out. And it's, you know, and if this is your response to having fermented foods the first time, ew, that tastes awful, it tastes kind of sour. You gotta get your taste buds in check because we are so in tune with just sweet things and sugary things and our taste buds don't even know what it is that they have for the, uh, for the, the power, for the effect that they have in the rest of your digestion. That our taste buds are not just on your tongue. We have a lot of taste buds all the way throughout our GI, and it's the things that are sour, like sauerkraut, <clears throat> that actually are you know, um, able to take down different sugar cravings too. So changing what it is that you have for those taste profiles, things that are bitter, things that are sour, those are things that actually help to curb some of the sugar cravings and help to change what's going on within your GI and start to increase that better balance. So the different fermented foods, um, you know, some of the things I've got in the picture up here, the cabbage, the sauerkraut, uh, kimchi, you know, it's, it's the things that we can use as fermented foods. I told you there's already hundreds of them. Um, that, that, you know, I, a lot of them I hadn't even heard of looking through the list and that's why ketchup caught my eye. <laughs> but it's the, the different types of the uh, fermented foods that are out there, it's what's the base of them, what are they starting with that you really should pay attention to because whether it be food allergies or, you know, even just different processed products that we can sometimes confuse as being a benefit or confuse as being something that's a huge benefit to us, it's when it's pasteurized or high heat, they're killing all the good stuff in there. So sauerkraut that's out there in cans that says pasteurized, all that is is just, you know, cabbage, sour cabbage. And there's really no probiotic benefit to it as, at all. So what was on, uh, you know, the, the picture before this, uh, I'll go back to it, the, in the little bowl there is actually some pink Himalayan salt or some sea salt. And that's what should be used as water, the, the vegetable, and the salt to create a good probiotic type of sauerkraut. So the different categories of things I have up here, there can be dairy-based uh, probiotic foods and there can be vegetable-based probiotic foods and there's, you know, just about anything can be fermented. And it's the, the dairy-based ones that I know a lot of people, you know, with dairy allergies or even just uh, issues with dairy in general, that knowing that yogurt, it doesn't have to be milk-based. There can be coconut yogurt, but it's the good bacteria that we're supposed to be finding in there that uh, both yogurt and kefir, they both don't have to be dairy-based. That water kefir is something that can be a benefit, and uh, the, the, the non-dairy-based uh, types of yogurts and things too. It's the good bacteria that are in there, along with the prebiotics, or the good fibers that they have, that that's really what we're looking for. So the, you know, the different things that I uh, um, put up here are you know, just some of the more common ones that hopefully everybody has heard of. Um, and it's the, the, the soy-based ones that I probably get the most questions on because soy is something that can be you know, very, very harmful for our hormone balance and even just you know, working as an anti-nutrient that it's the, the uh, fermented soy that you know, gets talked about a lot in different benefits, but there are some of it that you know, really doesn't have any live probiotic left in it, but the fact that it's fermented it changes a lot of the proteins and changes a lot of the different even phytoestrogens that are in there. And what I'm talking about is long ferments. Like some of these things can be fermented for years. Um, it's the, you know, the, the products that we get in the stores these days that just aren't the same because they're starting with a processed product and they're trying to you know, get it to the point where they think uh, if we just call it this, then it's gonna be you know, a benefit, people will buy it. And it's not, it's, it's you know, knowing that we've got to stay away from some of these things, that the, the true fermented varieties of them can be had sometimes, especially if we don't have an allergy to them. Um, but the, you know, the sauerkraut and kimchi, you know, those are always the ones that uh, um, are a little bit more common. People know about them a little bit more too. Um, it's the pickles that, I, I love pickles, 
but a lot of the pickles, there's a difference between something that's just pickled and something that's fermented. So the, the true pickles that are actually given a starter and the salt and you know, you've got the good bacteria in there, those can be an awesome snack. So there are a wide variety of different fermented foods that I put the, the cacao on there, the, the dark chocolate on, um, because a lot of people don't know that chocolate is actually fermented. That's why it's dark brown, because it was fermented. When it's picked right off the tree, it's actually, when you open it up, it's mostly white. And then they ferment it, it turns a dark brown. So the high amount, like you know, 90, 95% cacao products, those are going to be you know, given a lot of the benefit. They may not have any of the, the, the actual live probiotics in them, but they've got some prebiotics just as a, a part of that fermentation process too. So you know, it's the variety that we really want to get in the fermented foods. There's so many of them out there that we really just got to get that variety so that we're giving our body a little bit more of a diversity in what bacteria and yeast balance we do have too. So that's really what it all comes down to is doing things that are going to balance in the GI instead of just, okay, if we just have one probiotic, that's all we should have. And it's you know, making sure that we've got the, uh, the good bacteria in good balance that when we do have some things, whether you know, it's antacid or or an antibiotic in our history, those are things that you know, we can still work towards uh, uh, building good bacteria and building that balance. And it's knowing that if we do have imbalance, sometimes doing a stool test is gonna be able to identify what that imbalance is and looking at what even some of the good bacteria versus opportunistic versus the bad bacteria. And then you know, even just working with a wellness way doctor to find out what it is to, that needs to be done to get back on track. That I hope a lot of those fermented foods are you know, talked about and are, uh, are used. And even just trying to you know, try out a few different new ones and uh, you know, create some, uh, some new snacks to go towards that, you know, it's the sugary snacks and the processed foods that we got to get to do away with because they're just destroying our gut and they're creating more health issues for us daily. So, um, you know, even just the, the big picture on our GI is knowing that it's variety. It's knowing that we've got to uh, keep things in balance too. Um, so the, uh, uh, <laughs> the, the, the last thing I'm going to kind of finish up with here um, is just knowing that, you know, when we do talk about the, the testing and what a good probiotic is, because I'm not going to just sit here and say, okay, you know, the best probiotic in the world is this one. There's no such thing as a bad probiotic because what I'm talking about is no such thing as bad bacteria that are going to be found in a supplement. It's the balance and it's knowing that we've got a lot of different variety within it that looking at the different probiotics that are out on the market, it's the extra ingredients they put in there that make them bad. It's what they're cultured in. A lot of them are going to have dairy. And if you're trying to avoid dairy, you got to be really diligent in looking at those ingredients. And it's being a, a little bit more on the side of picking the foods over a supplement that I'm always going to be encouraging too. So, Thank you guys. Uh, I went a little bit longer than I thought I was going to this way. I guess I, I do uh, <laughs> I have a lot to say about this, and I could probably go on a couple more hours too. So it's a little, uh, <laughs> little bit I'll uh, leave for maybe next time too. But thank you guys for joining me this morning, and uh, um, we'll, uh, we'll see you at the next one.